to Breaking the Walls of Silence. I'm Tanika Gray Balbrun, and these lovely ladies are the national board members of the White Dress Project. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness of uterine fibroids and making sure that women who have fibroids don't feel alone. Due to COVID-19 and social distancing, we had to alter our annual programming this year. So we're bringing this reception, we're bringing this conversation, we're bringing this transparency to you via social media. The White Dress Project is dedicated to raising awareness of fibroids and the impact of this medical condition for women around the globe. We are all about empowering women with fibroids to be fearless. Let's be clear, when you have fibroids, you don't feel comfortable wearing white, but we use it as a symbol of hope and a symbol of empowerment that together we will get through this. Today, we're gonna open up we're gonna get real, we're gonna be deep, we're gonna share our individual stories with all of you. So grab your champagne and your blanket and whatever you need to do to get comfortable because we're about to get real. This is our celebration of sharing our stories and being transparent because at the White Dress Project, we believe that sharing our stories leads to our healing. I want everybody to just shout out one word that you are much more than your fibroids. So I'll start. I am much more than my fibroids because I am a phenomenal friend. I am much more than my fibroids because I'm stylish in any color, including white. I am much more than my fibroids because my purpose in life is to serve others. I am much more than my fibroids because I am gifted by God to encourage um, other women to be more than any circumstance that ever can come before you. I am much more than my fibroids because I'm optimistic about life and I know that there is purpose and there is, there, there's a, always a better outlook. I am much more been suffering with my fibroids because I've used it as a, to propel my purpose and being able to speak to women about not being silent. Yes. You are bigger than your struggle. Yeah. 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 I'm Taryn Edwards and let's get this girl talk started with a couple of facts. Fibroids are defined as a common disease that causes an abnormal growth to develop in or on a woman's uterus, creating pain, pressure, and heavy bleeding. Fibroids are compact tumors that any woman can experience during their reproductive years, but are more commonly found in black women. According to Healthline.com, fibroids are also known as leomyomas and they appear as non-cancerous growths and can vary in size or number. Although the cause of fibroids is unknown, according to womenshealth.gov, symptoms of these also includes bleeding, anemia, painful sex, difficulty in bladder function, and in some cases, issues with fertility and complications in pregnancy. And this is just the beginning of our talk. I want us just ladies to talk about some of these symptoms that Taryn mentioned. Like, what have you experienced? I know for myself, um, you know, my fibroid journey was about 11 years. And so my symptoms started in the latter half in the last five years. But I know one of the things is I had irregular periods um, and I would go through phases of either a heavy period or a light period and sometimes no period. And so um, it was confusing to me because um, just due to my age range, I thought that maybe I was going through, starting to go through menopause. Mm -hmm. But when in fact, you know, down the line, we figured it, it was symptoms from my fibroid. Yeah. And every fibroid, the other thing, ladies, the every type of fibroid that Karen mentioned, let me tell you, when you go through my, um, my MRI and even go through my sonograms, I had some of all of them. Yeah. Wow. So it, yeah. It's more common, you know, than I think sometimes we even realize in so much of our research even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And Kim, you were saying something? 
I'm just going to say for me, um, I experienced the really heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, that was one of the telltale signs of um, fibroids. At the time, I didn't realize anything was wrong. You know, I had the heavy bleeding. I had bleeding in between periods. I had heavy clotting as well, you know, and I never wanted to wear white because I would fear um, having an accident, which happened several times in public. Um, so I, like I said, I didn't think anything was wrong at the time. I sort of normalized it in my own head. But it did get to a point where I couldn't take a few steps without feeling like I was going to pass out. You know, and it was at that point where I, I said, you know, I have to go to the doctor. Something seems to be wrong. Um, and I went to the doctor, got some blood work done. My blood level, hemoglobin level, which is my blood level, came back a three. And a, a normal level is between 12 to 15 for women. So I was at a three and they suggest a blood transfusion if you're at a seven. Um, so they ran a, a host of tests, um, including an echocardiogram because I, I had a cough that wouldn't go away. And they found out that I, de I developed something called cardiomegaly, which is an enlarged heart. So I, I needed a blood transfusion. Um, they said that the only way to get my blood levels back up to a healthy level is to get a blood transfusion because at any moment, if I walked out, the, out of those hospital doors without getting a blood transfusion, I could risk going into cardiac arrest at any moment. Um, so literally fibroids almost killed me. And that really resonates with me so much in uh, Kim because I have had seven blood transfusions due to fibroids for mm -hmm. iron deficiency anemia. And, you know, thinking about fibroids and the way it impacts so many different areas of your, of your body, I feel you on that statement that fibroids almost killed me. But Brandy, I know that you didn't necessarily have the symptoms of heavy menstrual bleeding, right? No, I, and, and when I'm listening to you guys' story, it really just, it, it's like I went through my own thing, but listening to you guys' story is like, wow, there's so many things that I didn't go through. And I think that's where a lot of misconception with fibroids comes in. Because um, when I found out I had fibroids, the symptoms that I were, was having was more like bloating, really um, like always, always, always feeling bloated, always being like feeling like I was gassy, but wouldn't, um, wouldn't be able to pass gas. And with me being a flight attendant, a lot of that, that went on for months and me just thinking that was what, you know, it, I needed to drink more water. I needed to do different things. And never once when I Googled my symptoms, never once did fibroids come up. So I do think there's so many misconceptions. So I ended up going to, um, a gap and help me out ladies gastroenterologist <laughs> yes that's where i went and um they were the ones that um were like okay before we do the colonoscopy let's do um a ultrasound and they were actually the ones i, I remember it like it was yesterday and this was uh, 2015 and they said it looks like you have free floating blood in your uterus so we before we can do anything we need you to go and talk to your um to talk to your OB, we'll send over these test results. And that's how I ended up finding out that I have fibroids. And I think too, when um, women are just so used to like dealing with symptoms or yeah. um, like I started my cycle very young at nine years old. So like, yeah. you know, by the time I was in my twenties, it was just like, this is just something that happened. And um, also, you know, having PCOS and endometriosis, like it all ties in. So sometimes, um, even though I went to the doctor regularly being diagnosed with PCOS in 2006, and I still, even going every six months, never knew that I had fibroids. And once again, it goes back to all of the symptoms that we have that we don't even know sometimes are related to fibroids. Yeah. What you said, Brandy, was so important about um, being misdiagnosed. So it, actually, I think Amber said it, 41% of women go to two doctors before they are properly diagnosed with fibroids. And in addition to that, uh, women usually wait between three and five years before they do anything with their fibroids. So y'all, can you imagine going through these symptoms for three to five years, not doing anything about it, but also maybe not even really knowing what's going on in your body? Taryn, what was your experience? 
it was the first year that I started experiencing um, heavy bleeding, uh, cramps for the first time, because I never had cramps ever in life. Um, I didn't really have a heavy period ever. It was extremely light. And I started my period at 14. Um, so it, it was when I was working in my job and I work, work in a laboratory and I'm wearing, wearing my white lab coat, but I started feeling paranoid because my period was heavy and I was going through about five or six pads during, during the course of the day and changing and running to the bathroom as often as possible. And that's when I knew something was wrong. So I made my first appointment and I asked the doctor, can you check to see if there's something wrong with me? And she said, no, there's nothing wrong. Sometimes it's heavy. And so I went back home and I talked to my aunt who was a nurse. And she, she said, well, some, sometimes it's, it's heavy, but if you think it's something wrong, then, then make another appointment. So I made another appointment with the doctor. And this time she, she said, yeah, well, I, I noticed it's heavy. So then she put me on some birth control pills, the ones that um, give you like three or four periods throughout the year. Oh, the yes? Yeah, yeah. It didn't work. So then she uh, uh, had, had me to schedule an, another visit. And then I got a sonogram and they found the, the fibroids on that fourth visit. But this is in the same year because it, it was just bothering me because I was missing my clothes up. Um, and then the, she also gave me um, the Lupron shot. Mm, which um, yeah. uh, gave, gave, gave me pre premenopausal conditions and it stopped, stopped my period until the surgery was, was, was scheduled, which ended up being in January. Mm -hmm. So that was like in November, I got the Lucron and the actual surgery was in January. Mm -hmm. And that was when I did, did that all within the course, course of a year. I did get a second opinion just, just for my own sake. And that person found fibroids too. So, that's my my story. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so um, interesting that like imagine having to go through all of that in a year. Right. Yes. And it's like I don't even think sometimes we even think about that. I want to jump back to the point that um, Brandy was talking about, which are misconceptions. So, Juana, what do you think are some other misconceptions that, you know, women or, you know, just people have around uh, chronic conditions like fibroids. Wow, I tell you what, um, you know, oftentimes the doctors will share with us uh, that heavy periods are normal. Yeah. Um, and that is such a big deal. You know, we'll go to the doctor for our annual checkup or, you know, just maybe in between because we are having an issue. And when we talk about this heavy period and this heavy bleeding, then we may be uh, we may be advised to you know break out the heating pad you know change our diet um, you know mitol or some ibuprofen to address those matters when there is certainly some deeper issue going on such as you know what we all know now to be uterine fibroids and so um, oftentimes receiving some of the information that we have about um, heavy periods being normal, which uh, most of us now know are, they are not normal um, and they need to be um, researched further when we go to our doctors about that. Sometimes that can wind up costing us. When you were talking about doctors talking about heavy periods being normal, the first thing I thought about is our families talking about heavy periods being normal. Yes. Yes. When I got my period, basically in the morning from my mama, my aunties, a grandmother even that just just buckle up girl because periods in our family are that's and that's why even when I was first diagnosed in my twenties, I had heavy periods throughout high school, throughout college. And so I, I didn't think twice about those um, the heavy bleeding symptoms. Yeah. And unfortunately my doctors didn't either because I suffered from iron deficiency anemia. Um, for many, many years. But part of it was in my mind, I just thought, well, they told me my periods would be heavy and they told me that was just the thing that our family dealt with. So clearly this is just something that I have to ride out. And unfortunately, I do think we need to have that conversation about what is a healthy period, not just with our doctors, but with our younger 
girlfriends and, yes. and cousins um, because there are some serious misconceptions about how much we should be bleeding every month. Mm -hmm. That is very true. And I know, you know, for me, I started my cycle when I was nine years old. And so one of the things that I was told was that, you know, due to me starting so early, that contributed to me having such heavy periods. Yeah. Um, whatnot. So those are those are definitely myths that we need to address um, with our nieces, with our baby sisters and with the women in the area of our influence. Definitely. And I think another I don't know if it's so much as a myth or a misconception is just the the shame that comes along with all of this so that we're not talking about it. I think that's yeah. something, you know, that we need to break down now. Like we mm -hmm. need to, you know, normalize as, you know, much as we're able to talk about sex and be open about that, we need to be able to normalize uh, periods, healthy periods, you know, things that women go through that are, we are so, we have been, you know, it's taught to be more ashamed of than vocal about. So we are kind of suffering in silence. And that's where we come up with our programming um, that, that you started, Brandy, you know, Taboo Talks, because we really want to allow everyone to know issues below the belt yeah. are important. We need to talk about them. We need to destigmatize them. Um, and I think that every time that we do something like this, where we converse about it, where we get together, even if it's not on a public forum like the White Dress Project, but just having conversations with your family, your friends, your girlfriends, it, the more we do that, it eliminates the stigma. And Kim, you often talk about culture, and I think this is sometimes just like a, a Black woman's thing, right? We go hard, we're career-oriented, mm -hmm. we're educated, we're successful, so we just keep it pushing when it comes on to issues below the belt. Culturally for me, so my parents are from Nigeria and in Nigeria, there is a big misconception. There's so many, first there's so many women who have fibroids in Nigeria. And there's a big, big misconception that women who have fibroids will be unable to conceive. You know, so for, for me, my mother is always telling me, don't tell people that you have fibroids, you know, because you want, you want a husband, right? Exactly. You know, it's like you and your husband, right? Like if they know that you have fibroids, if they know that from the beginning you can have trouble conceiving, that might turn men away from you. Yeah. You know, so even being a part of the White Dress Project, it was kind of challenging for me in the beginning because, you know, sharing our story is a big part of our mission. Yeah. Um, so it was such a struggle for me to, 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 to fulfill that part of the mission. Um, because of the cultural stigma, because of the cultural misconceptions that, you know, have been so pervasive um, throughout my journey. Um, so like, like all of you were saying, that's why we're having this discussion. You know, we need to break down those walls of silence. We need to shatter the cultural stigma that is so pervasive um, around this issue and around other menstrual issues. As in Kim talks about the cultural side, I also talk about the educational side of it too. Um, as I shared with you ladies, um, my mom is a nurse, um, but when you put this in time perspective, this year my mom embraced the age of 70. And so you can um, think about at the time that she was going to nursing school, we can imagine that fibroids probably wasn't too much of a conversation or an educational course there. So um, I know for myself, I would think that mom probably from an educational medical standpoint didn't know what else to say to me during those years of the heavy period outside of you know, brace up like Amber was talking about and breaking out the Advil and the heat and pads from an educational, you know, and a medical standpoint, telling me what else to do or running me off to the doctors to get checked to see why I'm having these difficulties. Um, she probably did not know what else to say other than those basic things. That's such a good point, Solana. I remember um, to your point about, you know, just learning how to protect yourself and not really dealing with it. Yeah. I remember that you know, my mom had fibroids. I often share the story of her losing um, twins to fibroids, and I'm an only child. I'm the only one. I came in between a set of twins that she lost. And I remember when we found out that I had fibroids, she talked so much about just the protection. Yeah. I know how to line my underwear like no other. Yes. Yeah. I know yeah. about every mattress pad there yep. is. I know how to get stains out. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. yeah. My solutions, the bleach and yeah. et cetera, like yeah. bar none. Right so, there with you. 
Right. It's such a good point that you bring up that we really didn't even learn how to, what was happening in our bodies, yeah. but just learned how to protect ourselves. Yeah. I also remember when I was starting the organization, my mom was like, and you know, in her sweet Jamaican voice, <laughs> um, was like, you know, honey, don't tell everybody you had 27 fibroids. <laughs> like, mommy, I didn't put them in me. So, yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, but it was once again, to everybody's point, yeah. uh, not wanting uh, that shame that's associated, mm -hmm. not wanting, um, you know, their daughters to feel like they're being treated less than, undervalued. My mother was a nurse too. So mm -hmm. I feel that same, you know, protection, but mm -hmm. not really dealing with the issue. Yeah. Wendy, yeah. what did your mom say to you? Oh, so, I mean, I am like, you know, from the Facebook generation. So as soon as I found out like, oh my God, I have these things called fibroids. I'm like on Facebook, like, hey, does anybody know about this? And my mom like calls me immediately. She's like, take that post down. And I was like, what? She was like, you know, I have fibroids. You're on, you can call somebody and ask them about it. You don't want to put that out there. You're not married yet. You don't know what men are going to think. You don't. And I'm like, first of all, the problem is, why are you just not telling me you have fibroids? Right. She was like, yeah, I remember when I had that hysterectomy. I'm like, girl, that did not, you didn't give the details. Okay. So, I mean, I think it's like, it was, so, I mean, it was a struggle. It was like, okay, so do I go and take the post down? But then I was like, I mean, if I can share everything else, like, why not be able to share this? But I did realize people would inbox me, but they really wouldn't comment on the post. And mm -hmm. so it was like, from then, it kind of made me feel like, okay, well, obviously, I'm not alone. So I do need to speak out more about this. And then that's when... Um, just, you know, that happened in December. And then that summer was when I was introduced to the White Dress Project. And I felt like it was just like a purpose coming together. Because I was like, I don't want to be the only person, you know, in my city. Because that's, I went to Atlanta to, you know, be introduced. I don't want to be the, going through this alone in my city. So I want to speak out about it. So whether they have to inbox me or not, I just wanted people to know, like, I'm a person that you can come to. Like, you don't have to be alone dealing with this. The mental health piece on this, and then Kim, I want you to um, kind of lead us off into this, but with all the information, misinformation, pressure from family, stigma, taboo talk, it's easy, very, very easy, and I'm sure all of us can attest to this, and please chime in, anyone, if, if you wanna talk about this, but it's so easy to get anxious about fibroids. Um, and it's so easy to become desperate about doing something about it. And then you kind of lead into, you know, you kind of just pull the covers over your head and you're like, forget it. I don't want to do anything about it because it becomes too much. Um, so what do we think about the mental health piece? It's a critical piece of the journey, right? Like you were, you were touching upon the anxiety um, about either the diagnosis of fibroids or just going through the emotions and experiencing the symptoms of fibroids. So for me, um, I was diagnosed in 2015 and there was just so much fear for me around the next steps. Um, and, to, and in terms of my symptoms, I think I felt like a loss of control over my body, right? Yeah. There was so much in, un, what's that word? Unpredictability when it came to my period. Like I told you before, I would bleed in between periods. Yeah. So I, I feel like I would always be wearing a pad like every single day, even when I wasn't on my period, you know? So just that alone would cause so much anxiety within me. I just didn't know where else to, what, what to do. I didn't know what to do. and. I, they, my doctor initially told me that because I only had one fibroid that was on the surface of my uterus, that we could just wait, right? And see whether it progresses, whether it grows. So I didn't have surgery and instead they put me on birth control pills. And I've been on the birth control pill ever since. I'm on the devil shot now, but I feel like I'm a slave to the shot. You know, because <laughs> it, it provides me with so much relief um, but I feel like I'm in bondage, 
right? So, and that in and of itself, like I feel like being a slave to something causes a lot of anxiety as well. And Kim, I am blown away. But every time I hear your story, the fact that you were, we were diagnosed the same year and that you have had the strength to wait it out. Because I was like definitely um, one of those desperate people Tanika was talking about earlier. Like as soon as I was diagnosed in 2015, I was like, and my doctor, I said, so what are my options? And my doctor was like, well, you can have surgery. I was like, okay, sign me up. Like I did not wait. I did. I mean, I had to wait because it was, you know, the end of the year. I was diagnosed in December 2015, but I had surgery in April. I like saw when I could be off of work for a few weeks. And I was like, this is as soon as I can get off because I just, I didn't have um, those symptoms of even what she went through with the heavy bleeding, but just knowing what was going on inside of my body, knowing the pain that it had caused me for so many months, like I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't, um, I couldn't deal with it regularly or mentally like i started seeing a therapist right away because it came up with the question about um the whole situation about being able to have kids and you know what this meant and surgery on my uterus so of course like as being a woman from the south that's been raised to be a mother i feel like that was like something that played heavy heavily on my mental um so i wanted to see a therapist right away but i have to get them out right away i've had two surgeries now (laughs) since then but it definitely was something that i couldn't wait on and i think for me it was just so much fear around getting my uterus cut open like i've never had surgery before never so it's just so much anxiety about even the thought of going under the knife being under anesthesia you know, not knowing whether they go in with the anticipation of removing the fibroids, but they would end up having to take my uterus, for example, to save my life or something. Right, right. Right. It's just so much anxiety about that for me. I think that's another like misconception anxiety. You know, like we as women, you know, we think of our uterus as this like dainty, small, like cute little thing, but it is not. It is a soldier, no limit. It's ready to go to war. And the way it changes, like when you get pregnant i mean i like that was the last thing i was worried about i was like all right let's get this out like Mm -hmm. because i do think you know as women although we are all of those feminine dainty all of those things but we are also very strong and we're able to do things our bodies i mean like even the facts like you guys talked about like i mean i remember my iron was like five and six and stuff and i'm like the fact that i'm still walking around going to work flying across the country when Mm -hmm. i am literally bleeding for months like just showed me like no i i can do this i'm strong enough to go through this we have the gamut of the story you know what i mean so that's why it shows that support is so important because we can share with each other what each other has gone through, right? And the differences. So we can potentially encourage and can, you know, to to make the best decision for herself. And if that is not surgery at this point, then so be it. But Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes this conversation so rich that we have all experiences and we can really um, relate to a lot of the things that women are going through. I just wanted to share really quickly for me, it got really bad um, with the mental health piece because I think, and Kim said it earlier, you feel like your body is out of control and you feel mm-hmm. like there is nothing that you can do about it. So that just starts to weigh on you. Mm-hmm. And then in the process, you still have to be a boss woman. You still have mm-hmm. to show up. We're still out here dating, married, we're still having to be social with our friends. We still Mm -hmm. have to, you know, commune with our family members. Um, So all of that does become difficult when you're dealing with fibroids and you are literally in the bathroom, fetal position on the bathroom floor. You know, I'm, I'm one of those, you know, we talk about suffering in silence and I am certainly one who did just that. And when I saw that story, um, it certainly made me think a lot about my own personal journey. Um, because for so many years, as you just mentioned, you know, you, you, you are that career woman that walks out the door every day um, and going to your job. And, you know, I'm also an entrepreneur and on the inside, 
you have all of this going on. You know, you have this war going on on the inside um, medically, but on the outside, you are still trying to live day to day. And I know once I reached the phase in my life where I made a decision on what I was going, how I was going to address my fibroids. Um, and then finally I walked into this new next phase of my life for the first time without fibroids because my journey actually started when I was 19. And so um, I had one of my fibroids removed, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, one of my ovaries removed due to an ovarian cyst that crushed my ovary. And I was thinking about what you shared earlier, Brandy, because um, my surgery was an ex what was called an exploratory laparoscopy. The doctor did not know whether or not he was going to take my ovary until the surgery. So I did not know what was going to be what until we come out of six hour surgery. And so when we come out to share with my mother that, you know, Miss um, Tyler, she has two ovaries. Um, the other one is healthy. And I had a dermoid cyst and she said, we, want, he, we were unable to save this ovary. We, um, we thought maybe we would try to wedge it together, but um, the cyst was so heavy that it crushed her over and we weren't able to do that. So we had to remove it. But you know what? Dermoid cysts are rare and it's a 25% chance that she'll ever um, have that issue again. And so when she's ready to start a family, she'll be ready to start a family. And so, um, you know, you go on and here it is. I'm 19 at the time that it happens. And then here at 32 at an annual visit, here comes two baby fibroids um, to lead into what would start my 11 year journey. Um, and so, again, I, I resonated with her story so much because, um, as you ladies know, now I am, I have moved on from that physical journey. And now I'm here to encourage and empower other women um, in the same. But it certainly opens up a, a, a new eye um, and a new door to see that really from 19 to 42, I had this war going on on the inside. And for the first time in my life, I'm in a phase now where I am not internally fighting. I, I, it, to me, I always, you know, once I learned about what was going on inside of me, I felt like my insides had been completely invaded um, and my private space had been completely invaded. And that's how I viewed it. Um, it it's a tough space. It is a tough space to be in that journey. So I know you often talk about living and not dying and choosing to live. And I always, you know, think that's such a powerful mm -hmm. um, statement. Yeah. How do you, I just love that statement. So can you expound on that? I can, I can. Um, and so my, my fibroid journey um, was 11 years and it wasn't until the latter that I discovered that the two, two fibroids that I had um, were really 10 fibroids. I had no idea that I had endometriosis, um, that I had adenomyosis as well. Um, I had no idea that I had such an enlarged uterus. And each year as I would go to my annual visit, the doctor always asked me, do you, do you still want to have children? But um, choosing to live versus dying, um, I wind up making a very, very difficult decision um, to have a hysterectomy. Because at the point at which um, it all came out in the open, how many fibroids I have and how much endom the endometriosis that I had, my symptoms had become unbearable. Um, my day-to-day -day lifestyle had changed significantly. And I went through at least six months of being constipated um, and no cure, no, nothing from the doctor. You couldn't give me grandmama's cure to try to, you know, relieve myself. It, it just wasn't working out. And I had to make a decision. And many of the um, options that we talk about now at 42 and based on my um, medical scenario at that time, they were difficult to embrace um, the various options, although we did research them and discuss them. And as my health and my day-to-day -day started to alter so significantly and deteriorate, I had to make the choice to live or die. Because what I knew is that you could be a physically open living each day and out and about every day with your suit and your briefcase every day, but your insides can certainly be dead. And that's, the, that's where I thought I was leading to. And I, after researching and having hours and hours of consultations with my GYN and a second opinion with the surgeon, I had to weigh life or death for myself. I had to weigh my goals, where I was with my life, what I wanted to do in life, 
And if I were to become a mother, was I going to be healthy enough to become a mother at that point? Because so much had altered. And so um, in making my decision, as difficult as it was, as painful as it was, I chose to live. And that's for me what choosing to live versus dying versus dying was for me. You know, that was a really important conversation. And one of the things that Juana mentioned is just the range of treatment options. And you're right, there are a range of treatment options out there and it's easy to get overwhelmed. In a nutshell, our friends at CompareUF.org note that treatment options basically fall into three categories. So there's treating the symptoms, um, which a few of us talked about being put on birth control. Uh, there's treating the size of the growth of the fibroids, or there's removing or destroying the fibroids altogether. That's a range from, like I said, birth control and ibuprofen to a major surgery that takes you out the game for up to six weeks. Then there's the not treatment treatment. Uh, watch for waiting. Um, some of you out there who are watching might have heard this from your doctors. Um, I know I certainly heard it a lot on my journey. So with the limited options out there and the limited information out there, and again, kind of like we talked about earlier, this overall just culture of silence around your fibroids, I want to throw the question out to the group. How did you decide which treatment option was right for you? My doctor presented me with the option of, of doing three to four months of Lupron shot. And then because my uterus was so enlarged, she wanted rather than to do my surgery um, lap, lap, uh, to do it via laser, she wanted to cut me. And I had already been cut when I was 19. And I, being a reader, knew enough to know that, you know, all this new technology was out and that there had to be some other options. And so after reading more about Lupron, which I'd heard of before, thank goodness, I mean, I was not comfortable with such options. I began to do some research, something that we, the White Dress Project, talk to women about all the time, about being better advocates for ourselves. Um, what she shared with me was, uh, was so um, uncomfortable to me at this phase in life that I started to do some research first to see what other options were out there for me. And in doing so, I decided to get a second opinion to talk about my second options. And that's what assisted me in the process because I just did not want to go back under the knife again, knowing that there was so much technology out here now that maybe, just maybe there were other options. You know, for me, in the whole treatment options look, um, I was diagnosed first at the age of 22. I didn't have my first surgery until 10 years later, the age of 32. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a very, very long time. And for me, the watching and waiting and being told that by physicians mm. really influenced um, my decision making. I, um, I brought everything with me. I brought the journals about what's happening to me yeah. and everything they say do, right? So that you can be your own best advocate. Um, but being told time and time again by the medical professionals, um, that the symptoms that you're experiencing, is it really that bad? Um, mm -hmm. Led me to really delay, I think, the treatment options or, or seeking treatment. But again, I didn't think of it as a delay because this is what all the doctors were telling me was the safest course. Um, even as my uterus continued to grow and I went from being described as having a few fibroids to the size of my fibroids being described in terms of a pregnancy. Um, but you know, you start to trust medical professionals and you think they are the, they're the people who know best, right? Yeah. So surely if they're telling me to watch and wait, then I need to sit up here on this birth control and just keep on waiting. When I first uh, got diagnosed, I was told to watch and wait too. And I remember thinking to myself, like, Watch and wait for for what? Like right. what are we what are we waiting for? Because eventually right. they're going to cause a problem. And right. sure enough, like all yeah. of us in the test, they do. So sometimes I really don't understand the ideology behind watching and waiting. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when I finally decided to do something was when I got married. And I remember going to a, a white male doctor and telling 
that my husband and I needed to save our money um, to get a surrogate because it wasn't, you know, going to be possible for me. And um, to be a mother, it wasn't going to be possible for me. And that devastated me. And it was literally um, about four months after I had gotten married. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was very hard for me. But Mm -hmm. I ultimately came to a treatment option because I was thinking about what I wanted my end goal to be. And my end goal has always wanted to be a mother wants to be, I want to be a mother. I am a mother. I want to be a mother. And that's my mantra. I'm saying to myself, I am a mother. I want to be a mother. Um, so for me, ultimately treatment options needed to align with how do I get to motherhood? Um, Mm -hmm. so for me maintaining and, uh, self, uh, maintaining my uterus was most important. Um, now after I've gone through two myomectomies, now I'm like, is, was that my best option? Because now all of the scarring and all of the, you know, going in a second time and messing with your uterus, like that does have an impact on fertility. Um, so you kind of feel like you're in a catch 22 position. Watching and waiting is expensive. Yeah. Because... It can cost one, and I I, I just want, and this is why advocacy is so important. It can cost you your entire reproductive system watching and waiting. 11 years of my fibroid journey, and all I think about, you know, all I thought about at one point in time is, what if? So even if my decision had still been to get a hysterectomy, I feel like, or I felt like, I was robbed of the opportunity and the time to consider other things. Yeah. All these ultrasounds when I probably should have had an MRI years before I ever had one. Mm-hmm. I would put money on it today that I probably had endometriosis and adenomyosis and, and I had those 10 fibroids way longer than I ever knew about it. So watching and waiting is it expensive because of what it can cost us emotionally and in our health. And I, one of the, one of the reasons why I, I stand on board even still is because I don't want my niece or your niece or your baby sister or your daughter or the next person's daughter to sit around with any watch and wait. That needs to be over. It's dead mm-hmm. because it just costs too much. And just to even talk about it again today even angers me. And I just want every medical professional to even know about it, how much it angers me, because it just costs us as women, as young girls, it, as, as grown women, as women who want to start families, it costs us too much. Watching and waiting is robbery to our reproductive system. Like I said earlier, I mean, the reason I did have surgery so quickly was because I was desperate to relieve the pain, but I could never understand it. I'm glad my doctor never brought that to me as an option. Um, and I don't know if it's because the relationship I have with my doctor from having PCOS going to her for so long, but that she knew that I wanted to be a mother. So the watch and wait was never an option for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am so grateful that, um, even though I did, you know, had to have a myomectomy first and later ended up having the assess the procedure. I'm very grateful that my doctor took the time to listen to me, to hear like what my end goal was and then move at my pace. Like she knew I wanted to have the surgery as soon as possible. She knew the second time around, I didn't really want to have a surgery. So, um, I had learned about the assessor procedure through White Dress Project. And I asked my doctor, I said, hey, is this an option for me? Would you be willing to go to training to learn how to perform this? You know, she hadn't heard about it until I brought it to her. And she ended up going to training and she did um, the procedure on me because it is less invasive, less scar tissue. So I really think um, in the treatment options, I do think it's very important that you advocate for yourself. Mm-hmm. I do think it's important to even talk to other women and be like, what, what was your journey like? You know, and although, you know, you can only take people's advice for so much, you know, you have to decide for yourself. But I do think having that, you know, those discussions do help you come to a better decision than watching and waiting for sure. 
I didn't really have have anyone to tell me to watch and wait. And then at the same time, I, I kept pushing um, for relief, I guess, so, so to speak, because I got tired of being cold because I was anemic um, for that year. I got tired of um, changing pads. I got tired of messing up my clothes. To the final straw, I was in a wedding and I was glad the, the wedding colors were red and my dress was red. So um, to the point that I did, did have a small little accident, but nobody could see the stain in my dress because it was red. But um, back, back to the point, I did have a myomectomy. Um, and at first I was asking, could I have the UFE? since It was uh, laser. But my doctor said since I had had children and she, she wanted to leave the option open for me just in case. Um, she didn't really know too much about UFE. So her uh, recommendation at, at this time for me was the myomectomy and the, the incision is so small you can't even see it so for, for me that's what worked and I think a lot of it has has to do with cultural biases also so even though I know we're talking about the treatment options but at the same time you talk about culture you talk about um, race race and relations sometimes people think that people can take pain just based on race they can they can wait maybe they think that you can't afford it maybe it's just various topics that, that kind of trickle upon each other. And, you know, they all kind of have an, an effect. They think, well, just based on bias, she's black. She doesn't have insurance. She might not be able to afford it. So let's just make a wait. But I couldn't wait. I was too tired of feeling tired. So I just kept pushing. So that, that's my, my story. Well, so I don't know if the doctors your insurance or not but <laughs> insurance the whole time and experience the same thing um i just want to go back to tuana you talk about being angry about watching your waiting yeah I'm just as angry with you like yeah. all the campaign i've heard that there is someone out there doing research about whether or not watching and waiting should even be a standard of care anymore mm talk to them so if they're if you're watching this please call me yeah um but i want to say that part of why that's so dangerous i think i think back to my own journey again 10 years before my first surgery another for my second surgery yeah. the waiting in waiting literally made my options limited so yeah forward from 22 to 32 by the time i'm 32 and i'm ready for my first surgery um, I'm so anemic that they can only go in and take out a few fibroids because any other surgery would have been too dangerous for me. Wow. Fast forward two years later, um, 34, I have an open myomectomy. Um, I actually had it about a month ago now. Um, they ended up taking out 24 fibroids. I had a very, very large uterus. Mm -hmm. And I think if we had waited, if we hadn't waited so long, would have I had, would I have had the large cut i've got a large incision down from my belly button down to my bikini line i've got the classic cut they say i don't know why they call it that that's not cute um, but i wonder if we hadn't watched and waited for all those years would my story had to have end with such a major and dramatic surgery i feel like i had to make the decisions that i made back up against the wall and yeah. No woman should have to make such a life-changing decision backed up in a corner. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, my day-to-day -day had completely changed. It wasn't once a week or once a month. My day-to-day -day had changed, and I was definitely suffering in silence because this was not an everyday conversation for me. But, you know, some of the things that angered me, in addition to the whole watching and waiting, was every year or every single appointment, you speak. You know, my GYN talked to me thoroughly, but yet we weren't taking the steps that would have avoided me being in the position I was in in 2016, you know, to maybe had we addressed these issues earlier. And so I, you know, like I said, I put money on it. Those, those two five words were 10 plus, you know, because there were more, you know, but those were the 10 major ones, that, you know, that we, that we talked about at the time of mine. But there's so many things that, 
could have changed that we can't go back and change now. And so here we are um, as the White Dress Project in hopes that, you know, other women will hear our stories and it won't be the same for them. You know, yeah. there's a lot of conversation around diet and fibroids. And I personally yeah. believe that there has to be a balance between uh, what doctors are saying, the scientific aspect, and also what's happening within our bodies and, and what we're putting in our bodies, including yeah. the chemicals and the makeup and all of that. I feel like all of it has a balance. So mm -hmm. I do think it's important, um, going back to the point of having this conversation, so that we can share some of these things that other women potentially, you know, has, have more information to make better decisions about what their health, health outcomes should be. So we've been having a lot of discussion about symptoms of fibroids, the mental health implications, the misinformation, the misdiagnosis, and I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the research aspect. Over the past few years, our knowledge and clinical research of fibroids has advanced and helped us and our medical professionals to understand the complexity of it. But in the past, women would wait, like we said earlier, an average of three to five years before seeking any type of treatment. In fact, according to a 2013 study published by the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uterus sparing treatment options were important to women whether or not they were considering pregnancy. And I think that's so important because Obviously, not every woman desires to be a mother. So there needs to be conversations for both types of women. Yeah. And the fact and the statistics state that even if I want to have children or not, I want to consider saving my uterus. Yeah. A small majority, 51% of survey respondents, especially those under 40, desired a treatment option that allowed the uterus to be retained. Uh, more participants, 79 and 84% of those under 40, considered it important to have a fibroid treatment option that did not involve invasive surgery. One of the things that you know we stress at the White Dress Project is that there are so many research gaps when it comes on to fibroids. And kind of when we ask what causes fibroids, why are they here, why, they, why do they disproportionately affect Black women, it's kind of like, yeah. so for us, that's a problem, right? And I'm not saying that doctors aren't trying to do what they can and there aren't research uh, labs and scientists who are doing what they can, but because of the lack of funding, in my opinion, because this conversation hasn't been raised to this national level of importance, then it goes to the back burner. The one thing that has been scary because um, in this journey, like I said, my fibroids, um, I did get new ones come. Some of them that were left grew larger. And the scary part for me to re for research, um, the research aspect, which I want to be open about is that you have to get off of um, whatever you're on that's helping calm your symptoms. Like you have to get off of birth control. You have to get off of, I'm on, you know, pain medication. You get, have to get off of that pain management. And so, you know, I'm always torn. Okay, do I want to go and be a part of this research knowing that I will have like flare ups or will have like the pain come back and, you know, and then so how can I help but also like preserve my everyday life? I'm telling you some of that stuff out there. Um, I was a part of one where they do put you in like a pseudo menopause. And when I tell you those night sweats are no joke and keep... I gotta be honest because you can you imagine like I was like not even 30 yet and going through menopause like sweats worse than my mama I'm at with the fan out at church you know what I mean so I'm just like I don't know I wish there was something that we could do or better research or more money towards research where it didn't have to go that far you know, talking about research and talking about opportunity, uh, this year we have an exciting opportunity for us, thanks to Representative Yvette Clark in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, there's a bill, H.R. 6383, the Uterine Fibroids Research and Education Act. Um, it was introduced in March, 
and it would basically increase funding uh, to the National Institutes of Health, NIH, um, for uterine fibroids research. Uh, there's also parts of the bill that talk about increased public education, um, which is absolutely important based on everything that we said. So we have a real opportunity in Congress right now um, to, to make that a reality, right? So I believe the bill um, talks about $30 million in appropriations, which would be major. Um, so one of the things I know at the White Dress Project that we are asking folks to do uh, this Fibroids Awareness Month is to contact their member of Congress and ask them to become a co-sponsor. Um, I'm sure on our social media and so forth, we'll be sharing more throughout the month about how to make that happen. Um, but as we talk about research, it's absolutely important to talk about the advocacy opportunities that we have right here, right now. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that we are so proud of to be uh, the leading organization, we are the authors of legislation that declares July as Fibroids Awareness Month. So everybody pat yourself on the back because we did that and we felt like it was so important to get this designation because women need to know that they matter and women need to know that legislation in Congress is important to making uh, some of our, our issues and our stories elevated. Um, so we also have July declared as Fibroid Awareness Month, HR 140, introduced by Congressman David Scott that is currently in the U.S. House. And we uh, get that uh, resolution every single year because it is so important for us, like I said earlier, to know that we matter to our legislators. And this is an issue, to Amber's point, that deserves appropriations and funding and additional research. This conversation leads us to something else that is equally as important, um, which are health disparities, and health disparities specifically as they affect Black women, because fibroids affects Black women disproportionately. We talk about research. One area where at least the data points to one singular thing is that Black women are disproportionately affected by fibroids. Black mm -hmm. women are at a higher risk of getting fibroids and feel symptoms at an earlier age. According to mccloudhealth.org, it is estimated that 25% of Black women will suffer from fibroids by the age of 25, and 80% will have them by the age of 50, and that's in comparison to 70% of white women. Fibroids in Black women tend to be larger, more numerous, and severely painful. Black women are 2.4 times more likely to go through hysterectomy procedures. Although the reasons for the, these disparities have been unclear, um, it's been linked to several different factors. What we do know is that racism in medicine is very real. While gynecology has made clear advances for women, um, historian Deidre Cooper, um, Deidre Cooper Owens, excuse me, uncovered how its roots are intimately linked to slavery. Um, and that book is called Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, um, and, the, and the Origins, excuse me, of American Gynecology. So now fast forward to today. Um, we've heard all of the studies that talk about how Black women's pain isn't taken as seriously. Taryn talked about that earlier in this broadcast. Um, so let's talk about it. Um, have any of you felt like your pain wasn't taken seriously or feel like you've been ignored? Um, I can say for one that that is a very deep uh, part of my experience. Uh, pain ignored, but also just feeling questioned at every step of the journey. Um, I would go to the doctor, again, doing everything that I was told to do to be my own best advocate only to have the doctor say, well, are you sure? Is it really that bad? Um, even towards the end of my journey, um, well, I, I don't want to say end because fibroids can always grow back. But even up until um, my latest surgery, I remember I had an ultrasound report come back that showed that the fibroids had grown yet again. Mm -hmm. And so they sent me back to, at the time, um, the the surgical the minimally invasive surgical director and 
she said to me, she said, let's be honest, would you even be here if you didn't have the ultrasound report? And I thought to myself, what do you mean? Like, I'm doing everything literally I'm supposed to be doing, right, to treat this condition. And you're being questioned. And it's hard for me to believe. I, I don't believe that a white woman would be treated that way um, by a physician. And so I don't know if anyone else has experienced it, but it, it definitely is, is hurtful even. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely experienced it, which is why I changed my positions. Um, the first, well, the second position I had, um, she, I, I remember going for the first time to get an ultrasound with her and she was doing the ultrasound and she, she made a statement. She said, your uterus is massively distorted. And I said, what does that mean? You know, in the moment, I was just a bit taken aback by, by her statement. And she was just very nonchalantly, oh, just what I said, you know, and I just noticed the pattern of um, just the way she speaks to me is very condescending, very sarcastic, uh, which is what, which is part of the reason I delayed getting surgery because she told me I need to get surgery and I didn't want her to do my surgery. So, which is that's part of the reason I delayed getting it. Um, so I switched my positions night and day. My current physician takes the, the time to explain things to me. Um, he, he listens to my concerns. He addresses my concerns. And it's a partnership. You know, so I'm currently in conversation with him about what the next step is as it relates to getting surgery. And that's so real in Kim. I always say that finding a doctor is like finding a partner. Like you literally have to be on the hunt to see who has your best interests. Mm -hmm. it, it's like going on a date, I feel. Like if you're not for me and you don't want what I want or you don't see the options that I want to have as my outcome and can see a path to that, then maybe you're not the doctor for me. Like maybe you're not the dude for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like it's such an individual process. And I love the, the way you use that word partner, because that's what it is about. It's about, as patients, partnering with your doctor, not necessarily denouncing the, all their schooling and their education that obviously I don't have, but understanding that this is my body and no one understands my body like, like I do. Nobody's with my body like I am. So I have a role to play in this too. And that's what we talk about, you know, when we talk about being our own best health advocate. So it, it really is on a journey and an individual process to find your best partner. The disparities piece and the, the different treatment that women, quite frankly, who have skin like ours, mm -hmm. receive in the doctor's um, office is part of the reason that our organization exists. Uh, so one, we obviously support um, being your own best health advocate. That's what we say all the time. We say it on our social media. We say it when we're in person. We say it when we're virtually. Um, and so we advocate for that. Um, but we also can't lose sight of advocating for systemic change. Because yeah. if the doctor is looking at me differently, for whatever reason, like Taryn said earlier, if the doctor is looking at me because the doctor doesn't think I can pay for something, the doctor is looking at me different that I feel pain differently. It doesn't matter how many journals I walk up in there with. It doesn't matter how many uh, kind of reports I walk up in there with. Those preconceived notions and biases don't change. And it's the way that I'm treated. So I just think that represents the, the duality of need for our organization, right? We, we need to help one another be our own best health advocates, but we also need to push back on the system and say that it's time for some real systemic change. Dealing with the discomfort of fibroids will affect lifestyle factors such as diet and exercise. At the same time, exercise has been shown to play a significant role in reducing the risk of developing fibroids and the painful symptoms. Diets that are rich in fruits and vegetables have a positive effect in reducing the likelihood of worsening and developing fibroids according to PubMed.gov. And diets that include a high alcohol intake are linked to having a negative effect 
and may increase your risk for fibroids. Alcohol raises the level of hormones needed for fibroids to grow and triggers inflammation. Since the strongest reduction risk in fibroids has been linked to diet and physical activity, exercising for a minimum of four hours per week will keep you on a healthy lifestyle track and reduce painful symptoms. As we're talking about these lifestyle changes, the things we've um, done differently, the things we probably would have done earlier if we had recognized the importance, um, they all lead to lifestyle overall. And this, this segment I'm really, really excited about because it is leading to really the premise of the White Dress Project. You know, I always talk about starting the White Dress Project because my mother lost two sets of twins due to fibroids and I was the only one of her children who made it. I am her miracle baby. I'm an only child. Um, but she's not the only one who has gone through something like this. And I want everybody, if you feel comfortable, to really delve into how you feel about the motherhood journey as it intersects with uh, your fibroids journey. And I do think it's important to note and for our audience that none of us have children. And, um, you know, what we talked about before that not every woman wants a child, which, which we have no judgment about is perfectly fine. But if you do want children, um, what, how does this play into everything that fibroids brings with it? Um, so I just, I just want us to be transparent about that moment and how, kind of how we come to those decisions about what is going to be our path to motherhood. I will be completely honest. Um, like I've stated before, like I am from the South. I'm Texas. I'm a Texas girl. Um, so I feel like before I even knew what being a mother was, I was taught that I wanted to be a mother. And I, I think that, um, like I said, with even my mom saying, hey, don't put this out there because you don't want people to think, you know, and whether that's a misconception or not about, you know, not being able to have children. For me, it's a reality. Um, and I am 35 and I'm not married. And so it is a very real, it's very triggering. It's very, um, it, it saddens me when I think about it. And, and Kim, I know earlier you have talked about, you know, not making a decision yet uh, on what you want to do about your fibroids. So where are you in this motherhood journey, knowing that you still have to make a decision about fibroids? So to be honest with you, that's part of the reason I haven't make it, made a decision um, because I do desire to be a mother. And with the statistics out there, the fact that if I do get the surgery, there's a possibility that the, the fibroids might grow back and then I'm going to have to do a surgery again. And I don't want to have to keep doing the surgery before I have children because I don't want to have to do the surgery multiple times. So I've been praying to God that he blesses me with a husband so mm -hmm. that, <laughs> so that, you know, I can get the surgery six months down the, the, down the line. I, I potentially, hopefully can get pregnant. Um, and also it's it, what Brandy said resonates with me as well, because I was on a telehealth visit just a couple of weeks ago. And he said, my doctor said, you're going to be 35 next year. So you, you should really think about pre, and I would be remiss as your physician if I didn't bring this up to you, mm -hmm. but you should really think about freezing your eggs um, because at the age of 35, your, the quality of your eggs starts to diminish. Mm -hmm. So that was really, you know, just coupled with the fact that culturally, as I mentioned before, you know, there's a, this, this misconception. I don't know if it's a misconception, but there's this perception oh that women who have fibroids cannot have children, right? So I don't, and I, and I think just thinking about that and what I'm experiencing now is really, it's making me anxious and it, it, it's making me really fearful, like thinking to myself, like, oh my, what if it's true? Like, what if I won't be able to have kids because of my fibroids? So that's where I, that's where I am now, you know, just praying that I can have kids, but ultimately maybe coming to the reality that that might not happen 
Um, so it's really emotional. Um, it really elicits a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, of uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. And I think too, in Kim, I think we've talked about it before, like with us being like dating and stuff. I was like, there is no handbook. I don't, I've read all the books on fibroids. Nobody is saying, hey, you talk about fibroids with a potential boyfriend on the eighth date. You talk about this, like you let them know, hey, you don't let him propose to you before he knows you might not be able to have kids. Like, I don't think anybody is talking about the fact that you're living with this, you're trying not to mess up your clothes, you're trying to be happy, you're tired, your blood low, you're dating, you don't know, you might... You're going through all of this and you're really supposed to just still be a woman in everyday life and not spaz out sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, and not drink either. That's, I, no, I can't do it all. And I have a, <laughs> no sugar. Like, we got to talk about how this is affecting every part of your body. And then they say, no, just go exercise. No, I'm depressed. I want to eat a cupcake, drink a whole bottle of wine. And I'm on Match.com. Like, we got to get it together, sis. Like, <laughs> sorry for the rant. No, but I agree. And also, like, my sister, my older sister has fibroids. But she never experienced any symptoms. She was able to have three kids, you know. And I'm over here, and I'm like, oh, Lord, can that be me? Like, I, mean, I want to be able to have kids. You know, she didn't have any symptoms at all at all um so it's 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 been a, it's been a lot you know and i've been staying with my sister for the summer and like just having her kids run around and you know i think that's also pretty triggering for me as well very much so yeah the motherhood conversation actually mm -hmm. i think that was the point in my fibroids journey where my mental health was the most unstable. I remember before my first surgery, having my first ever MRI. And at the appointment before the MRI, the doctor essentially intimated that, you know, one of the things she might be able to see is the likelihood of me being able to have children or at least be able to forecast something. And I've always been in the position of, I want to have kids, I'm happily married, but not quite yet. So suddenly it hit me like a ton of bricks, like, whoa, was I wrong in taking the not quite yet stance? What is she gonna say? And that period between seeing the doctor, having the MRI, and then going back for my follow-up visit with her, which was about a month total, probably the worst month of the journey. I was crying a lot. I was lashing out at my husband. There was just a lot of fear and anxiety to in Ken's point about just thinking about the gravity of, whoa, like there's a major life milestone that I've always seen for myself that now may not happen. Um, and so ultimately I had to be very fiercely intentional about compart not compartmentalizing that piece a little bit because I knew that if I kept thinking about it and you know, kept wondering and, and stayed in that place, I wouldn't have been good for myself. I would not have been good for my marriage. I would not have been good for my professional life. And so for me, the motherhood conversation, I think is really where I had to like dig deep and, and decide to, to kind of take a stance for my own sanity. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm anywhere perfect right now coming off of my second surgery. I think we're going to maybe start trying soon. Um, so I'm keeping up a little bit more. Yeah, I say that with trepidation because this is about to be public. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of creeping up. But again, it's the one area that I have to be super intentional in my thinking and, and framing about this experience because without that intentionality, I would be a mess. I was a mess. I just want to throw my personal experience in there. Um, most people know, or, or most of my close family and friends know that I have always wanted to be a mother. I don't know if it's the only child in me. I don't know if it's the constant desire to have more people around me because I don't have brothers and sisters. I don't know what it is, but I've always, always desired to be a mother. And I just wanted to touch on Brandy's point earlier about, you know, not having a manual about 
how to deal with fibroids and as it relates to dating, there's definitely no manual about how to deal with fibroids as it relates to being married either. Mm -hmm. And you don't know, you know, if your husband is looking at you sideways because he's thinking, you know, he's seeing you up and down with your, uh, you know, the emotional battles that you can go through, whether, you know, the constant bleeding, it interrupting your sex life um the just not wanting to interact and not wanting to be a partner and when you're married and living with somebody every day you gotta show up and you gotta be a partner and and everybody talks about you know marriages work so you have to find ways to interact and sometimes with fibers you just don't want to do that you don't want to talk to nobody you don't want to kick it you're not jokey jokey like none of it um so that's such a great point that like there is no manual for any of this and there is so much emotional up and down with it that it it causes um you know interruptions in our lifestyle which is which is what all of us are talking about because you know sometimes especially in our culture it can seem like oh you hating you know mm -hmm. you just want, don't want the best for people it has nothing to do with that but sometimes I just can't deal with another baby shower because right. of my deep desire to be a mother. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's another thing that often gets stigmatized and we have to talk about that more, that those are real feelings that we have. Um, so my, yeah. therapist, my therapist said, you have to, I have to get to a point where I had to grieve the life I had imagined for myself yeah and when she said that i was like girl like i like the girl moment i need it because i was just like it is to that point where it's like you and i think society you know you do grow up and you have this image of what your life will be like at this age and at this and then you're going through it and nobody tells you but your body might not do any of the things that you want it to do and I think it's even more triggering to to be able to look like we look, go to work every day. Like it would be different. People would have more sympathy for us if we were like laid out in a hospital bed. Yes, every yes. Day. People would have more sympathy for us, like if they could physically see something wrong with us. But yeah. because they can't physically see what's wrong with us, they just think like, ah, oh, well. Well, get over it. Or maybe kids aren't for you. Like, I just don't, I, I mean, this is a very, this touches my soul, the lifestyle part. Because I think it's something that is not only you have to deal with and get to a point in your mental space, whoever you're with has to get to that point in their mental space, your family. Like, it's so many moving pieces, but no one can look at you and tell you, tell that your heart may be broken. Right. Because of what you're going through. Yeah. And I think that that is so unfair mm -hmm. to be able to see somebody laying in a bed and have sympathy, but not have sympathy for me because I, my body has basically turned on me and is not doing what society says my body is meant to do. This one girl who I'm friends with, I'll say friends, she put, um, she posted something. She said, a, women, real women were meant to have kids. And I lost it. Like well, you would have thought she called my mama a bad name. But it's it's so important that we talk about the fact that, like you said, Brandy, we all are here looking beautiful, uh, you know, speaking articulate, like a uh, seemingly all of the things that we need to be characterized as great women or boss women. And all of us are dealing with this. So that, that's such an important point to bring up. And the grieving part of it. Dr. Uh, or therapist Tori, you know, we had her on our IG Live uh, a couple months ago. And she talked about the importance of grieving every aspect of something. So grieving that you've lost an ovary is important. Yep. Grieving that your IVF cycle didn't work out is important. And sometimes we miss those. Tawana, what do you think? You know, things came to a head for me. Um, I was 38 and, you know, that's when things started to really, really, really pick up. But at 42, looking at, you know, the various options and what the um, rate 
at which they would be successful. To me, you know, surgeries and based on my current condition at the time, one of the things I thought about for as much as I had always desired to be a mom, I didn't want to go through multiple surgeries. And again, I was 42 at the time. I felt like, I want to be very careful with my words there, that I was robbed of my mother, <laughs> you know, my opportunity to become a mother. And I do not believe that the process that I was taking through with my GYN, not my surgeon, with my GYN, was okay. It was not fair to me, and it would not be fair to any other woman. And so, um, also, um, to so many points that you made, Brandy, um, people, particularly women who already have children, so many times don't know how to talk to you and I. Mm -mm. Oh, do you want mine? Don't worry about it, girl. You'll be okay. Do you want my daughter for a while? You want my son for a while? Just bring her back. But you can have mine. Don't worry about it. Um, or the other one was, you're 41, 42. Girl, you still don't have any children. How did you do that? How dare you mm -hmm. talk to someone that way, a woman yeah. that way, especially when you are already a parent? How dare you? And then also, why do you even, girl, just live your life. Why do you even want children at this point anyway? You have this, 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 and this. You don't have to worry about a babysitter. You don't have to worry about when you're ready to travel. You don't have to worry about your cycle anymore. But amazingly enough, you have a child. You've had an opportunity to become a mother. You rave about your son or daughter or children constantly. And that's what you say to another woman who does not have a child or especially one who is challenged and really desired to have one, but you know, certain health circumstances would otherwise um, hinder such. So it's such a um, painful time. One, that you already have to try to make decisions about your health. And two, one of the very desires of your heart that was so major, you just have to um, let it go. And so what your therapist said about having to grieve each process yes you do and i mean you there's no way to even prepare for that if you will there is no way to prepare but you if you want to choose um to live as i had to choose to live i had to choose to grieve each phase if you will and so um i was able to take so many of the negative comments that were made to me and i was able to use each and every last one of them as a um, arm of power to me now and um they are completely under my feet now yeah. um, and i'm able to show um a whole different light with my life now because of that but i only there were times when i just wished that i could say oh i'm still in my 30s and i'm still fighting fibroids and i'm still seeking options but that's not the way it went down for me. And it's not okay. And I don't want to see that happen to other people. So that's why I say with that watching and waiting, certainly I understand because I've already walked that walk. But if you have been equipped with some knowledge and understanding, I would encourage every woman to pray to God, mm -hmm. pray to your support circle, seek your support circle, and make some types of decisions for your health, for your life, and for your peace of mind. And don't stand back into a corner because it takes some time. It's already enough of a grieving process just to go through it. Mm -hmm. But when you have to grieve in that manner, it just adds to, it adds to that, that, that pain that you have to, to grieve and to work towards overcoming. And so um, you talked about, hey, you know, sometimes people say to you, there are other ways to become a mother. That is a hard thing. But I had to, on my own, say to myself, you know what? There are some other things to consider about life that are so precious. Because if this is what God has planned for me, then I, I still want to live, so I am going to have to find a way to embrace the path that I am currently on. 
and wherever this path is taking me. Is the path going to take me to adoption? Is it going to take me to becoming a foster care parent? Is it going to take me to Sarah? I don't know. Is it going to take that? No, you are just going to remain an auntie to some amazing nieces and nephews that I've been blessed with. And you're going to go on it in your career and in your entrepreneurship. You're going to keep doing great things. And you're going to keep supporting other women. Maybe that's what it is. But whatever it is, I have to embrace it right where I am. And I will no longer accept <laughs> any negativity any comments or any darts that would be thrown at me because now where I stand as encouraged and empowered as I stand is whatever you try to throw at me concerning motherhood is going to bounce and probably hit somebody right back in the forehead if you try me now if you will but I swear um there's there's I I just woe unto the person who comes for me now as it relates to my motherhood so Taryn where are you on your journey that that question does come up at family gatherings. What's taking you so long? You know, I know you're getting up in age and everything. Um, but at the same, the same time, I had a, had a conversation with my dad. He said, Taryn, you're not too old. You know, my mom had, had, had me at 45. And I said, really? Wow. <laughs> and he was child number nine. So at the age of 40, 45, um, he, she wasn't really expecting to have him at all, but there, there he is now. And he's over the age of 70 now. I think he's 72 now. So I, I live my life daily and I see it as I'm not going to live thinking about this every single day because I have to keep living. And I know that along this, this journey, it will take place at, at some some given time i don't know how it will take place or in what avenue it, it will take place but in one of those ways it will take place let's lighten the mood a little bit and let's talk about sex baby let's talk about you <laughs> okay nobody's gonna join me okay i got you so you. <laughs> as you all can imagine fibroids has a grave impact and can have a, a serious impact on uh, your sexual life and intimacy. And I think it's so important that this is another uh, thing that we talk about because fibroids and sex is another topic that we don't talk about as much as we should. And they're all down there in the same area. So it, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that they could have an impact. So I want to talk about the pleasure and the pain of sex. And I'm going to toss it to Brandy to kick it off. Well, hello, guys. Um, <laughs> now, I would say, you know, it, you know, part of my story is that I didn't tell. I was in a serious relationship when I first found out that I had the fibroids. But, like, after reading so much, after my mom's reaction, I didn't want to tell the guy about I was with that hey I have these things so you know I really just skated over the surgery skated over everything and um endured some painful sex but it really wasn't until after my surgery um I had surgery in April then September rolled around and I would have this breakthrough bleeding because I was on um the continuous birth control and then the breakthrough bleeding started to last for some weeks at a time so again, like I said, I'm in Texas, Houston, it's hot in October, and I'm sleeping in a full onesie in bed, like with my boyfriend, because I still have not told him about fibroids and about how it's bleeding, and I don't want to bleed on his bed, or I don't want, like, it was just so much of a mental thing, or I don't want to tell him that the sex is painful, so I'm just there suffering and you know as you can imagine trying to hide my face and my facial expressions just because this is something that you know again there's no handbook how do you explain to somebody that is supposed to be bringing you pleasure like that really hurts or i really don't want to do that all right i'm not sleeping in this onesie because i'm anemic i'm sleeping in it because i don't want to ruin your bed like that takes all the fun out of sex like to have those conversations and so um on a side note after surgery sex is a different beast but back to pre-surgery sex it's just so many things that i wish that 
you know, we could just talk about and just be honest with and be like, listen, this hurts. I don't know how long it's going to hurt for. I don't know. Maybe this angle is better than the other. Like it's so many different things. And I mean, I don't know to the married women, you know, do you guys have these same converse or is it better to, is the good better? That's all I want to know. Whew. So, um, well, I mean, even honestly, post marriage, um, pre fibroids or pre fibroid surgery, I can just be honest and say that actual intercourse just is never fun. Like, I could have had a V8. I say that in jest, but also be honest. I could have had a V8. And. <laughs> I, I wonder, no, in all seriousness, I wondered, was painful sex a symptom that was worthy of treatment? Like, I would bring it up, but I never really pushed on that. And so now, you know, being a little bit older, being married, being on the other side of, like, years of experience in the, the medical world with this, um, I see now there is more, a little bit more conversation about painful sex as something that really needs to be taken seriously. But when I was in my 20s, I just thought it was something that I kept to myself. And like Brandy said, you, you keep your face closed because we know that men have egos and yeah. we know we don't want to hurt them. But yeah, um, pre, pre-surgery, it was like, mm, I mean, I guess this is cool. And I remember talking with girlfriends. This was more so in my 20s before marriage. Um, I remember talking with girlfriends and girlfriends, you know, how we talk, girl talk about not anyone in particular, but you talk about how you enjoy sex. And I just didn't have those same experiences. And you kind of feel like, is something wrong with me? So um, I bring all that up just because I'm glad now that we are talking about it here. And I hope that more folks talk about it because it's something that it's important, right? It's not like just some side, oh, if we can get to it, we can get to it. It's a very important part of our lives. So who And I also want to bring up to especially the women that have been on the extended birth control or the yes or the birth control, the low estrogen birth control, not only the painful sex, but the dry sex. Because a lot of people don't talk about that either. But when you're on all these different medications or when you're on this um, where they don't want any estrogen getting into your body because estrogen, you know, the fibroids grow from that, then it causes like dry sex. And then you're in like you're young and trying to buy lube or trying to figure out like what works or do you need to get the O shot, which is $1,800, by the way. I just think there's so many things this just affects your life in so many ways that I don't think we don't talk about enough. And so I'm sorry, I'm passionate about it. And I, we appreciate your passion and you bringing up that Yaz piece made me think about, you know, so far we've hit on kind of the, the physical components of it, but then there's also the hormonal part, right? Like your, your desire to even have sex. Um, is affected by your hormones, which can be tied back to the fibroids and everything else that might be happening in your body at one time. So you've got a double whammy. Not only does it not feel good in your mind, you'd rather be just chilling in bed with a book. And so it can be really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, that's so important because when I think about the hormonal piece, I think about being married and like I was talking about earlier, having to interact and converse with somebody every day. And, you know, when I was um, single, I lived alone. And if I didn't want to call nobody, I didn't call anybody. If I didn't want to go out, I just told my girlfriends I'm not coming. But when you're married, you know, you're constantly thinking about the emotions of someone else and how your your actions can impact them. So ladies, we did it. We were open, we were transparent, we let people in, and this has been an exciting virtual experience. Um, I know that I would want to be there with all of you right now to hug each of you because I feel like we opened up, we shared so much. 
but I feel like this experience is just as good and I feel like we have touched people. I know I personally have been touched by all of your stories. Um, in our final minutes, if there's anything inspirational that you can leave with our audience, this is our first time doing this. And I just want to take a moment for all of us just to leave something inspirational that if you got nothing else out of what we tried to do here today, that you will get this. What can we tell women and even men who are supporting women going through this, what can we tell them to inspire them and just to give them hope to keep going? You are bigger than your fibroid journey. Um, and you are a powerful tool. And I encourage you to tap into your superpowers and tap into God's plan for your life. Fibroids does not control you. It does not define you. Today, I want each and every one of you to reclaim control over your life, over your health, and over your well-being. You are powerful. We are powerful. Um, I've once heard that um, your story is the most powerful tool that you have, and it really is. Um, you can use it to help others, and you can use it to affect tremendous change. You are your own best health advocate. Nobody knows your body the way you do. Nobody knows what you're feeling in your body. No one knows what you are experiencing. So stand up for yourself. Be your own best health advocate. Your body will thank you. You can talk to other people, get a support team, and also ask questions along the journey. And remember that your journey is not scripted. It just might be unscripted. And have hope. You are not alone. Don't allow your shame to keep you suffering in silence. We are all here. Ladies, I really appreciate everybody being so transparent. We have empowered women today. I do believe that by sharing our stories. So please make sure you to all of our social media channels, Instagram, we can wear white, Twitter, we can underscore wear white, and on Facebook, The White Dress Project. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye.